I can hear you. Okay, now I can hear everyone. So let's go. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our finance and performance meeting today. Josh, am I correct that it is Councillor Seymour that will open our hui today? Yes, that's correct, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Seymour. Morana Tata. Um, Lord, give us thanks for the environment in which we live and ask us to be tolerant of the views of others and to reflect when we think about what we need for today, that we reflect on what we need for tomorrow. We ask this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that, Councillor Seymour. Welcome, everyone. Um, today, it is our first finance and performance meeting for 2022. Uh, we've got a chunky agenda that we will work through today. Um, I ask that everyone, just as per our Zoom protocol, make sure they are muted when they are not speaking. If you want a speaking term, Pat, please text me when Bill or yourself want to speak. It's just much easier. I cannot follow the discussion on screen as well. Um, everyone else, just make sure you put your little yellow hand up. Then it gives me the opportunity um, to give everyone the chance to have their say. So um, without further ado, I am going to start with our agenda. I do not see any apologies. If there is an apology, please um, make sure you put your hand up if you know about an apology, because if you're an apology, you won't be here to raise your hand. Thank you, Josh. What do you want to say to us? Uh, an apology for Councillor Dowsing for, for attending Thank the you. meeting. And also I received an apology uh, from Councillor Faulkner, she's just having connection issues. Thank you for that. So Councillor Dowsing did email me about his apology. So moved by Councillor Farehinga, also Councillor Faulkner for lateness. I'll second that. All in favour. So again, I'm just asking, um, thank you everyone. Visible hand up when we vote because um, it's really difficult otherwise to see that's carried. Do I have any declarations of interest today? If not, we move to our minutes. So our minutes are on page five. So um, thank you, Donna, also for sending out minutes to all councillors to have a look just after um, uh, we've had our meeting, when the meeting is still fresh in our minds. So thank you for that. And then any feedback goes to Donna and those minutes are corrected before we then take a look at them today. If I have no issues or questions around the minutes, because I see no hands up, do I have a mover for our minutes? Thank you, Councillor Sheldrake. Do I have a seconder for our minutes? Thank you, Councillor Akuhata Brown. All in favour? Contrary, carried. Okay. Any questions on the minutes, Pat? Do you? I did ask for questions, but I didn't get any. But um, you go, Pat. Thank you for your text. Thank you. Page eleven, Madam Chair, under Land, Rivers and Coastal. It's with reference to the work on the Tarahira River, which we can all see here in the city. When will that work be finished, please? It's been going going for most of this year and some of the end of last year. How far away from completion is it? Um, for your worship, we'll come back to you with the response on that, Councillor Seymour. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillors? I see you, Councillor Akawaka Brown. You need to use your Bart Simpson hand. Um, finished in the chamber? Yep. Okay, Councillor Akawaka Brown. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, listen, uh, my question is just respect to the cycleway that's um, mentioned. I, I'm kind of going between pay, papers, etc. Um, the Crawford Road, um, and I'm just wanting to know: Have we had any feedback? They talked about residents, um, you know, talking to the impacts of the cycleway. I've just had a resident email me today, though. So I just wanted, um, Madam C, uh, will we get a report on how how that's working? How how are the relationship between residents and the cycleway uh, is, is going at the now. Um, just interested. Kia ora. Um, thank you. Through your worship, there is the section on the quarterly financial reporting and there are activities in there, so you could um, raise it within the context of that report when Mr Wilson is back online. 
Thank you. Heather, can you please resend the link to Councillor Faulkner? Her link is not working. She just texted me. Thanks to you. Now. Awesome. Can I just quick quick comment on Meredith's question? Um, using that cycleway quite often, I have noticed that the parking issue that it was about has seems to have alleviated. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be the problem it was a month ago. Thank you. Okay, councillors, then on the action sheet, there were only two actions which were updated for us. Thank you, Mrs. Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Hadfield. Please just make sure you remove your little hands. Otherwise, I think you still want to ask a question. Okay, any questions? Oh, that, well, there were no questions around the action sheet because they have both been updated. So without further ado, councillors, I take you to our first report of the day. But before I do that, I'm just going to run through our agenda. We have no leave of absence. We do not have acknowledgement and tributes. We do not have public deputations today. We do not have extraordinary business or a notice of motion or adjourned business. So I am going to ask that everyone go to page 17 of our agenda. So this paper is to seek approval to bring forward development contribution funding identified in years six and seven of our current long-term plan. And the amount for that is $1.2 million. So there is a paper um, in front of us. Who is going to lead this paper and just open up the floor and then we will um, open it up for questions. Who is the council member, Nadine? Um, through your worship, I don't see Dave Wilson or Neville online, but I think the fundamental part of this is that we are uh, wanting to bring forward $1.2 million. It's already accounted for in the long-term plan. So really the, um, uh, the question is around the financial impacts that this might have, and so Pauline can respond to those questions. Thank you. Okay, I've got Councillor Farihinga Foster Cranston. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, paper, this paper was very straightforward to me. Um, I'm happy to move it. Uh, it's, we often get criticised as a council, as a council table for how slow we are on providing infrastructure to new development. This is our... our um, council staff coming to us saying, hey, we need this for this future development. So I'm more than happy to move this paper, your worship. Thank you for that. Councillor Foster. Yeah, thank you. I was quite the same. Uh, I'll second, I'm happy to second it. Um, we need to make sure that we um, keep up. We've got a housing shortage and this is an opportunity to start alleviating some of that problem. So we need to be on board, um, approving all the infrastructure and getting it underway as soon as possible. So more than happy to second it. Thank you. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, just a, a question around, um, I know with the development contributions, um, there is a, a line in there that says specifically for the development that it um, relates to. So just uh, with this big development we've got going on at the moment and other development contributions going into that pot, um, yeah, how do we work our way through that? Because, uh, yeah, it's sometimes not specifically the development that, the funds have come from that are, they're getting used for. So. Thank you. Ms. Foreman. Um, uh, free worship, yes. So what, what happens, we collect, um, and I think in, in the actual development contributions for wastewater at the moment um, is uh, in positive territory. It's over uh, 1.4 or 5 million. Um, what happens is when we forecast and the development contribution says, what are the projects that we need over the next 10 years? Um, and what are the things that we expect to come in? And so that's how we set our um, development contribution price. So in actual fact, some of the infrastructure that you get for some of the developments won't be able to pay for the full infrastructure, but it is attributed to um, across all the infrastructure that's needed. So effectively, um, what we've planned for in the long-term plan um, is those uh, projects that was in the Te Arahiru, and it was then worked out that this is what we would need to have from development contributions. This works out the price um, that you would need to contribute if you were doing a development contribution um, over this period. And it works in infill um, and other aspects into account. So there's 
and we revise it as we, as we need it in every three years. So if it needs to go up or down, um, it's adjusted accordingly. So it won't be a direct one-to-one -one relationship to the projects that come through, um, but this is works out the prices needed to do the work that we've planned to do. Thank you, Pat. Yep, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support the paper, but I'm just wondering if we are applying the principle consistently, because I understand the same um, improvement to the sewer pump stations is what's necessary for the element subdivision to proceed. Um, so are we consistent in um, seeking to do something ahead of time to meet the needs of the developer, which is great in the case of Hanson Road, but what is the status of in, the improvements needed to enable the Elmer subdivision, which has been underway for much longer, to proceed to have its sections marketed? Thank you. Mr. Wilson, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so... We have been working with the DIA Three Waters Reform and working with a number of developers around the upgrades that are needed across the district. So we have talked to a few of the interested parties in the Elmers block. We understand the timeframes that they are working to. The funding submission that we have put in has will cover off in time by the time those developments come online. Oh, thanks, Madam. Thanks, Mr. Wilson, the subsequent Madam Chair. But so why are we needing DIA money to do that when we can pull this money from development contributions, which is absolutely what it's for? So what can you please explain the difference? So through you, Madam Chair, it's because the funding for Tarahiru is in the long term plan. Some of the upgrades that we're requiring for the other pump stations that are there are not within the funding for this 10 year plan. They sit further out in outer years of our um, infrastructure strategy, sorry. Thank you. Your Worship, can I just add to that? So part of the, um, the your call, we were successful in moving to phase two of the infrastructure acceleration fund. So there is a significant amount of money that's there um, for us to support though the upgrades that will be required um, when those areas are, um, are developed and, and hopefully that will come through towards the end of the year. Thank you for that. Chief Executive. Okay, Mr. Tony Robinson, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Wilson, this paper raises the question in my mind as um, our understanding of the broader infrastructure barriers to development and you will recall I've raised with you on other occasions that report which uh, I don't know where it's at can you just let us know please um, and just give us a probably everyone's forgotten by now a quick background of that nature of the report and where it's at please and when we might get it and when it might be made public. Through you, Madam Chair, the report that Councillor Robinson's talking to is a report that's been undertaken to look at the capacity of the wastewater and the wastewater network primarily across um, the whole of the Tūranga area for where we have capacity to take on additional housing or for additional subdivisions with our existing infrastructure, but then also looking at what additional infrastructure would be needed. So that report, I have promised you, Councillor Robinson, um, it has been getting peer reviewed at the moment. Um, we are behind on bringing that through, but we've been able to use some of the draft assumptions for our applications that we have made, but we want to make sure we're right with it um, as the peer review. I will have to come back to you, and I apologise, and I'll see that you um, will come back to you on when that is once I get the key staff member who's looking after it, who's away on leave at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Councillor Aku Hutter brown Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. I just wanted some clarity. You mentioned DIA, and I know Councillor Seymour's picked up on that too, and uh, Three Waters. Is, is, um, is that something that uh, the benefits, I guess, in speaking around infrastructure needs, like this pump, uh, is going to be part of the conversations uh, for our region? Because um, I, I, I guess we're all still trying to work out what that, um, that space means for region. So is, is that these some of the conversations that we will be having um, with the DIA Three Waters Reform Team? So through you, Madam Chair, there's a couple of different funding streams that are being operated at the moment by central government that we're looking to see how we can tee into to make sure we get best we can for region. So there's the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund, which we have um, 
been working through to try and bring these pump stations along to help with the housing um, in the district and ensuring that we have the adequate infrastructure for when housing does go in. There's also some funding that's coming um, from DIA potentially through the Three Waters Reform um, and that's around um, no council being left worse off um, as part of the funding that's there, but then also there's um, the funding that we get as councils for our assets. So there's a number of different funding streams that are coming out through the Three Waters. The Infrastructure Acceleration Fund is the one that we're working tangibly on right now while the Three Waters Reform is happening alongside that, because as you know, as councillor, we're sorry, no decisions have been made so far on that. So when I think of housing, I do know it's a very complex process. And um, as a council, we only play a part in housing development. There are developers um, and people that actually build housing like Kainga Ora. But for me, our two main parts are having plans like our district plan and our Tairawhiti resource management plan that is fit for purpose. So that's what we as a council doing right now is reviewing our Tairawhiti resource management plan in order for it to be fit for purpose. Because if you remember, less than 10 years ago, Shamobil Jakob, the economist, said that Gisborne would be a ghost town and that we would have nearly no growth until 2050. That has changed for us. And we are now in a position where we are dealing with growth problems and we are reacting as fast as we can. So by having fit for purpose plans, that is one leg of what we do. But the other leg that our little stool are standing on is making sure that we have the infrastructure ready for when development comes our way. Also being said in our paper is that even though we plan, the process is still driven by private development. So um, in a certain way, it's we can plan, but we also need to be agile. And so I applaud staff. Thank you for being agile, trying to make it work as best as possible so that we can play our role in our housing um, developments here in Gisborne because if all the cogs don't fit together this process of, of growing our housing stock won't work. So I have a mover and a second, a councillor Farehinga, councillor Foster, all in favour, hands up. Contrary, carry. Thank you for that and thank you Mr Wilson. Okay, councillors, we move to our draft annual plan. Thank you staff for pulling that together as everyone's page 24. As everyone can see, it is quite consistent with our long-term plan that we signed off last year. So as we all know, every three years, we develop our 10-year plan and every year we have our annual plan that are one of those steps to get us to our 10-year plan. So um, who is going to speak to this, Nadine? I can I can speak to it. Um, and if you, Pauline. Um, so, uh, as you've um, eloquently said, Your Worship, um, this is this is what it is. This is the the chance to actually we set our long term plan, um, and in the interim years, we we have a look at that to see has there anything been changed when we set it, um, and we do that through the um, annual plan, and. Um, and this is a chance just to say, okay, what were the changes? And most of the changes as outlined in the report are, are things either um, from category changes or uh, draft uh, changes to the way financial um, standards are recorded. There is not significant or major changes um, that occurred from what was consulted with the, the, the long-term plan. Um, and um, that's probably uh, it. Most of the things goes into the details of what those changes were, where it occurs, and the, the other aspects of it. Um, just to, to reiterate, um, when we do the draft, it is up until a particular point in time, which is up until December, and it includes that. Any decisions that occur thereafter, um, say like in the, uh, January, um, council meetings or anything subsequent that um, we included into the uh, final. But at each time you have that, um, even with the uh, reports that you have, any financial impacts, we say what those financial impacts would be before you make a decision um, and you can assess it, what it will do for, for those changes into the um, annual plan. But that's it. Happy to take any questions. 
Thank you. I'm going to start with Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy um, to move the receipt of the document or the, the noting of the documents, but to start with, I'd just like to double check with council officers. Um, page 24, the front page of it, and it repeated on 27. The walkway, the completion of the Uawa walkway is actually a walking and cycleway. I understand if we're talking about the same thing. So can we just, can I please ask if that's so? And if it is, then can cycleway be added to the heading? Please. Uh, that's not a problem. We can make that adjustment. Because it needs to be made clear for, to the community and for others. And I have a second question on page 33 on, under employee benefit expenses, which are considerably more than in the um, LTP, um, but is some of that to capture the decisions that were made recently with respect to the percentage? Um, so no, that, that solely um, recognising um, the differences of uh, um, other projects that hadn't been captured at the long-term plan. So where before they were recorded under operational costs, um, like the Wainaki, um, they're now recorded um, under the employee benefits. So there are changes that have occurred overall between the categories, uh, the operating and employees costs, um, that's, that's reflected in there. Are you saying, I'm oh, sorry, to supplement you, Madam Clear, just to be clear, is that that 28.725 mil, is that the will and allow for the decision that was made recently around? Some, some part of it, um, not all. That is still to be come into the final. So some part of it was recognised within this draft, but not all. So that figure will change then? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I'm saying. Yeah, any changes that was made since um, uh, in January and on will be adjusted into the final. So that figure could become substantially different? It, it could be different, yes, um, by that adjustment. Thank you. And then I just have another question uh, further through on the first um, big, the capital expenditure spreadsheet. Could you please... Um, it's the first page, 38 of 205. How much of that Wainaki restoration project is um, externally funded for one year? Because that's at 20, at 2.65 mil, how much of that is external funds, please? I would just have to double check. Um, it assumes are uh, about a 30 or 40% um, grant funding, but I'd have to have a, um, come back to you on that one. Could we have, have could we have that information, please? And then further down in the capital expenditure, and I just wonder why we're treating some um, slightly different to others. We talk about roadside bollarding for the Terra Hero Cemetery, and then I presume some bollarding that might be happening on our own parks and reserves would be captured in the parks and reserves. Is that true up above? Uh, free worship. It's mainly because of the categorised cemeteries as an activity that's rated differently than uh, a little bit different from the other reserves. And, and so that's just um, additional information. There's no other real differences. Thank you. And then thanks for that. Then a question to the chief, to Madam Chair. Are we going to discuss fees and charges now? Um, or can I ask my questions now about that or shall we save those until further through the report, Madam Chair? Pat, just finish up your questions because I think it might be easier than trying to get back to it again. Okay. So just... Well, thank you. And then I just want to go to the um, fees and charges um, set up. And I, I know that you're aware of this too. There has been come feedback. It's around the Lawson Field Theatre. Quite a bit of feedback um, to the trustees who fundraise for that about the fees and charges. And um, I want to acknowledge that Penny has responded to that and that we try to keep it cheaper. But I just think, and it does intimate that I think they're going to stay the same. It's not quite clear on this page as it is on some others, but have we taken into account or can we please take into account the needs of our local community? Because that was part of what, you know, the Lawson Field Theatre was upgraded and the funds were raised to make it a little bit cheaper for those who need to use it. And we are getting feedback the trustees, you've heard it too, Madam Chair, um, haven't you, about the cost of... The, so is it, has that been taken into account or can it be taken into account? Because it doesn't give me the column to compare with what it was previously. Um, 
I just answered before we do get any answers from the others, but it just that is on page uh, 76 of your agenda, um, yes. which goes through the information. Um, and if you look at it, there is meetings and seminars um, in one of the columns, and it says commercial, uh, professional and government and community and voluntary groups. So um, the community and voluntary groups uh, is basically... Um, for the theatre hire is a 590 compared to commercial, which is nearly double. Um, so some parts of it has been taken into account when they when they do set that. Um, if there needs to be further uh, review, then that would obviously come through. And I won't say anything more because that would probably be um, in the theatre's um, regime. Yeah, because it, even $500 or $300 is quite a lot for a um, voluntary group or a community group. That's that's the point that they have been making. And and then there was one other point, and I guess it's reasonable. We get a bit of feedback around cemetery fees and charges, but I see they have actually gone up. Only They have gone up, but a relatively small amount. And I suppose we have to do that to cover the cost of inflation. Yep. Thank you. For thank that. you, Madam Chair. Okay, Councillor Cranston, your hands up. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first one was on the statement um, that uh, completing more than planned for the township upgrades. Is that one township or more than one township, or is it a set increase in township spend? Um, yeah. Um, Free worship. It's actually just saying in dollar terms. So, um, if I take you where you can actually see that, um, is yep. actually on page forty of the um, the uh, agenda, and down the bottom of that is got the townships, um, and uh, there's a column that says. Um, in the long-term plan, it was 480k um, by securing some extra money from Wakata and subsidising it. Basically, the amount that we can actually do next year is 715k. Um, oh, cool. And the other one was on the fees and charges. Um, I see there was a fee for $66 for going out and getting a troublesome dog. I just wondered if that's a lost situation for us because I had a situation where I was we were trying to get a dog and they, they probably had to come out two or three times before they actually found it. And when they did actually find it, it took more than an hour for sure. So just wondering about that fee, um, yeah, not being a loss. So if they come out to get a dog that's prob problematic and they don't find it, there's no way of retrieving that. Uh, through, through you, Madam Chair, I can probably answer that one. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, um, it's very difficult to charge. So sure. some dogs are easy to catch, some dogs aren't. Um, we, we do take an average on those. Overall, um, that activity uh, with the inclusion of, you know, the, the dog registration fees, et cetera, um, is covering its costs if we uh, do the inflation adjustments that we've proposed. Yeah, even if it was one call out in the got to the dog reasonably quickly it would probably be almost a lost situation because it would take at least an hour okay mm. that's quite operational and i'm sure staff try and manipulate and, and work in a way where we can um, make sure the costs are covered if it is possible um, I would have paid $66 at 5.23 a.m. this morning for a barking dog in our neighborhood but um, yeah Anywho, let us get on to more questions. Nadine, I'm sure what I'm going to say now is you're going to steer daggers down the camera at me and the comms team are going to have a heart attack. One thing that gets to me um, every year, our community, I, I'm not talking about going out and consult with our community at all because this is just an annual plan um, update, but I was just wondering how we communicate this. Will we have... Uh, a nice printout or a, a he panui or just communicate with our community. We are in here too now. This is what we're doing. These are the slight changes so that our community is on board um, with what's happening and how we do it. I know in this COVID time, especially it is, um, I'm not suggesting meeting anyone face to face or talking to anyone face to face, but I would like us to communicate well with our community, what we are doing this year um, how we're planning to fund it and what they can look forward to. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so our intention is to communicate through um, our social media, uh, through the newspaper, the media as well, um, just kind of the high level um, takeaway. So yeah, Hipanui will be part of that um, right. campaign. Fabulous. So I have a mover in Councillor Seymour. I'm going to get a seconder in Councillor Hughes, I see. Hand up, Councillor Hughes. Oh, yeah, just and one I more can question. Ask your question and then oh. we'll vote. Oh, yeah. Um, no, my question is just, I hope you're this part of the same thing, on page 58, just around building consents. Yep. Um, which is part of this paper. Um, just the question around how, how much we really get from building consents and whether we want to look at it at council about uh, is the revenue we receive um, worthwhile enough because the costs are prohibitive to other individual payers uh, to cover additional housing and whether that's something we want to consider? Are we better off, for example, in the worst case scenario, wiping consent fees, wearing that burden and encouraging development um, of housing and the financial impact of that? That is not a straightforward question, but thank you for that. Pauline. Um, there's, it, it's actually a significant impact um, in the building, in the fees you actually get. Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but at least 650K um, that you're actually doing. Um, and if you also then have to consider how is that with your principles um, of your revenue and financing policy, which is um, should some of those costs be to more of the people that receive that benefit, the user pay, as opposed to rating people generally. Um, so uh, not a straightforward um, answer, um, but someone has to pay in terms of it. If it's not fees and charges, it will be rates and it, it, it would still be a significant shift um, with regards to it. Yeah, I guess my, oh, my potential counter that would be by creating new buildings and that then we could potentially increase our rate stake. So it's almost like a temporary funding of, of something to reduce the barrier to create new housing that can then be funded through rates later on potentially. But yeah, I, I agree with the essence of it's something we can cover when we discuss our financing policy again. Mm -hmm. Quick smart, Councillor Robinson. So just following on Isaac's point, um, it, it is a question that I've also chewed over. Um, and it would be interesting to know just you know, as he's talking it through, what would the implications be if we were to reduce those fees? How much of a disincentive or barrier are those fees actually in the overall scheme? And I guess when you look at the cost of, say, building a new building, if you're going to rent it out at three, four hundred thousand dollars um, I think the fees as a percentage that are relatively low. So I would like to understand, are they an actual barrier or are they just simply another cut in the death by a thousand cuts to, um, to extending the housing rental market in Gisborne? Thank you for that, Korero. And I'm sure that could be part of a bigger, uh, when we talk about financing and policy at financing revenue and financing policy because that would tie into that like you say a more strategic view um, so that is a discussion we would flag with Pauline going forward um, if you if you like madam chair I can make a brief comment about yeah, the percentage please. of costs um, so councillor Robinson is right um, building consent fees as opposed to the cost of building a house um, are a very very small fraction um, when you're talking a build of about um, uh, $500,000, you're talking fees of about uh, $3,000. So um, the value you get from ensuring that your building is, is going to be built right and to code, um, is, it's quite a small cost compared to the cost of doing the actual building. Um, the other thing to consider besides the revenue and financing policy is we have a, um, an obligation to to pay a percentage of the cost of a building consent fee uh, to the Ministry of, um, to NB to, um, so if we to make a, a zero fee scheme for our building consents, then our general rate payers are paying the cost of those things, not just, you know, in, in terms of our staff and, and, uh, and overheads, et cetera, but also in terms of those fees that we have to pay to um, organisations outside our own. Thank you for that, um, Ms. Montgomery. And yes, that is a discussion for us to have in the future because it is, we are trying to encourage people to build, but do it in a safe way, also cover costs. 
So going forward, that is definitely a discussion worth having. Thank you for that. Um, so Ria, just before we move on on that topic, I just want to actually acknowledge um, the consent staff efforts in building. I have been personally witnessing their attendance at um, uh, Hikarangi Trust's uh, building site on Nishin Road. Um, and I've been really impressed with just how accommodating and um, professional they've been in trying to find resolution because those guys are pumping up emergency housing at such a rate that um, they're almost too fast for the inspectors to get there. But the, the team from the council, um, from observation and feedback, have been really superb. So I just want to publicly um, acknowledge that. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Councillor Robinson. CEO, please pass those regards on to, to our hardworking team. So I've got a mover in Councillor Seymour and a seconder in Councillor Hughes. All in favour? Contrary, carried. Thank you for that. And thank you for the staff that pulled all of this thank together. You, to to the okay, councillors, we are going to move to our treasury report, which is on page 84. So I just give everyone the opportunity to get there. These are our standard financial reports that we look at every month. The next three of those um, are usually just making sure we comply with our financial policies. So thank you, Pauline. I will take these reports. Do you want to give a quick, just a high overview, Pauline, and then we open up for questions? Um, uh, this probably is, is read um, with regards to it. And we're just mindful as, as we go through this, as we increase in our debt, just what are the forecasts is where the um, changes are occurring. But we're also mindful of working on um, what are the interest rates, what are we expected to be forecasted from PwC um, and the Reserve Bank uh, with it. In terms of that, we keep on forecasting what we actually said in the long-term plan and we revisit that saying, is that still relevant to what we had included um, in the long-term plan, which was 3.4 against what's coming out now. And it seems to be still in alignment with what we have. Um, and that's due to the, the swaps um, and mitigating those kind of interest rates um, movements at the moment. So happy to take any questions though. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thanks. So just trying to find the page. There was a graph on interest rates that was declining through the year, and I just didn't understand with my knowledge of what's actually happened with interest rates through the year. Um, page 88. 88, 88, 89. Yeah, thanks. So in terms, that was, on, yes, as you say, on page 89. Um, mm. And what um, on page 89, it says, um, what, what did we... The, the yellow line is what do we include for the long-term plan? And that was 3.4. Um, and you can see that drop down in the first year. Um, the um, black line is actually what have we achieved? And that's a ba um, basket of goods. And, and it has dropped down. It's because as old long-term debts um, uh, have been repaid and, and as swaps have actually been renewed, we're getting... Um, uh, lower interest rates, which are about 1.98, and some are even lower than that. So the older, more expensive interest rates are being replaced with the new. So that's why that's dropping. Um, and the benchmark is the the what would that be um, against um, the if we didn't have any swaps or any other uh, mitigations to reduce for paying for those costs. And so you can see. Um, that's what it would be without any of those risk takers taken into account. Um, and, and that's where it is at the moment. So it is, it has been reducing. Um, does that mean it will stay? Um, no. That's the discussions <laughs> we actually have to come in and see um, what's happening with the Reserve Bank uh, and what are their longer term projections. But even with that taken into account, um, they are still saying that we're forecast to be within our benchmark which is that black line of 3.4%. Thank you. Okay. So I'm happy to move this paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Akuata Brown. Okay. All in favour? Contrary? Carried. Thank you for that. Thank you, Pauline. We move on to the rates and sundry invoice deck management, which is page 92. 
again, I probably don't have an awful lot to add. It is, it is what it is. It just says what are the movements were at that particular chart pants um, of the court of the six months. Um, it, it and also ex, uh, explains why some of the other um, changes that have occurred. Um, but happy to to take any um, questions. I don't see any hands. Stibby, Councillor Gregory. Okay, I'm mute. Good. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question from. It's difficult to hear you, Debbie. You might have to sit closer to your computer. Okay. Um. So on page ninety-four, um, I just got a question regarding the rates rebate. Um, I was just wondering that seven hundred ninety-five thousand is that higher than normal, or is that you, what usually comes through as a rebate? Um, I can't. I, I think it is a little bit higher because the quantum of um, that uh, is allowed has increased. Is that, and we also has some of them goes to the retirement homes, which wasn't before. But I'd have to come back to you exactly um, what that is compared to what we had before, and we can easily give you that as an update on the actions. I was just wondering, in terms of whether how many more people are struggling than with COVID and everything. Um, so. And so there's two two parts of it. There's the, the rates which comes through from central government, and then there's the the remissions that council um, has allowed, which is if people are suffering in hardship, um, that they would apply for that. Um, and in terms of uh, an additional one, if there was COVID related um, uh, issues, in terms of the COVID related, there hasn't been. Um, uh, for I think for the whole year or even from the two years that we've been in there, it's been about 80K. Well, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Akawaka Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pauline, thank you for um, all your explanations and advice. And when I, just when I read low income earners on that page um, that uh, Councillor Gregory just noted, do we have a criteria what, uh, what is a low income, um, albeit that some of us, you know, consider that with the changing times of incomes? So is there a criteria that says this amount is low income? Uh, yes, um, it's sent by central government. Okay. Um, so bear in mind, uh, we we apply, do the things, and the, the thresholds are applied for central government, and then it comes, we get that money reimbursed to us for all that rebates that um, it comes off the rates and for the life of me I can't remember it off I think it was about for two people um, about 35 to 40 thousand but I would have to come back to what the the thresholds that they have set and whether they um, slowly increment um, that each year but um, again if Fiona and unfortunately couldn't be here today she would have been able to um, give you that advice but I'll, I can easily come back to you what that yeah, threshold is. Thank you because I just would like to know whether we have seen people moving up the ranks in our region or we still have quite a considerable number of people in that space so yeah I'd love to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Seymour. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just a question with respect to the graphs on page 97. And please, Pauline, remind me, uh, the graph actually, um, and I'm just looking at general land, that 2.5 million is the rates. The graph below, is that showing the whole lot? It looks to me like it, because it's showing it just under one. Between yeah, sorry, it is sometimes a little bit confusing um, for your worship. Um, so effectively, 2.9 is the total debt. Um, and the one below shows how what's the age of that debt. Um, yeah, but is it the is that both the rates and the penalties? Yes. So, oh, sorry. Um, it separated them out. The blue line is the rates, and then it shows the green. Of, yes, it does too. Thank you. So, are we concerned then that we are growing? Because I'm not really worried about this year because that some of that actually gets absorbed, doesn't it, in the next quarter? But if we look at the 2021 figure that is quite a lot more than the previous year. So is that causing us some concern? 
Um, so in terms of where we compare to where we were uh, the last period of time, it hasn't, it seems to be static with regards to it. There has been a little bit of um, delay um, and, and some of it about 150K, but not significantly increasing that we would be concerned um, with it. But um, there's not a, a different trend from other years, but we are still obviously um, actively work with the debt that we have. And most of those are on um, management plan um, to be able to uh, look at paying that back. Right, because if we then look across to the accumulated debt for all properties, it's quite considerable for the year 2021. But isn't it? So you're saying that most of those, both Māori freehold and general land, are they all working on payment plans? Um, I, I would have to come back what the percentages are. There's payment plans that says in a graph for each of the sections is 25% um, for general rates um, and five for that. Um, so th there are um, various parts of it, how it's being paid. Um, I'd have to come back to you and actually say, okay, what have we got a, a different issue with 2021 than we have previously? And we can, we can come back and expand on that in uh, a little bit more detail in another report. Yes, because it does, I mean, I can see what it says about the payment plans and there's actually less people in the total, when you look at the total rates debt column on a payment plan and a quite substantial number and coded pale brown on, in our spreadsheet, which have other or none. So that's about 40% of the debt has in, would either have, an, I presume, and an a different, but it doesn't say what, or no payment plan. And then we've got 13% with return mail. If you add 13 to 39, we've got quite a number of outstanding um, a quantum of debt where we don't have a process in place, I take from the graph. Yeah, yes, um, I think we probably will go a little bit more in detail as to actually what it means. It says uh, um, some of the returns, but doesn't actually say if it's been captured as at once as a return mail, it, now are they on um, a payment plan? So I will make sure that the next report that comes through just gives you a little bit more in depth um, with regards to those details of the 2021 debt. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just, should we be concerned or is it all under process? That's really the basis of my query. Um, in terms, because I look at it um, where we were at each particular quarter, where we compared to the other ones, and I only noticed that perhaps with the COVID, there was a little bit of a delay um, and that had uh, in some areas, um, but most of them were working um, with payments with it. And so there was a bit of a, an increase of about 100 to 150K in terms of that um, is increasing debt, but otherwise um, it's tracking as uh, per normal situation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. So on, on the very same um, question, on the same topic, um, to me, it looked as if for the last three years um, that we hadn't been tracking as normal um, because it had been flatlining in that left hand graph for the, the first three years and then it takes a very steep increase. Uh, these are age debts we're dealing with, so um, it's been around for a while. It's not like new debt that's become unpayable because of COVID conditions. And to me, it almost looks as if we've either changed our process in following through with this or there's been the change in policy in following through with this. So can that please be clarified? Because it looked in the first three years on that graph, on the left-hand graph, that we were um, had this under control and then it has escalated significantly in the last three years. I'd like to understand why, because if, if, that's, if that is a continuing trend, it is a very big problem. So I'll just explain it. The, the fact that you haven't got old age debt means that what's... Um, on the books of 2.9 is great because most of it's current. When you look at 21, 22, that's current. Um, that's what's included as your normal operation. So that you would expect to have um, uh, increases in those others. And this happens at each and every quarter that we um, give this report. Um, it hasn't uh, extrapolated more than the growth than it was in previous years. So it's just saying, how old are these debt and where it's occurring? So no issues with the 21, 22. It's just saying, has the growth of 2021 increased at a faster rate than the others? And as I said, 
of, of that, of the total amount that we've got at 8.4 million, we've got perhaps um, 150K um, across the whole of the district, which um, isn't too much of an uh, acceleration um, with it. But in terms of it, uh, we can give you more details of what's in that 2021 at a, a, at a subsequent report. Thank you for that. Okay, last question, Councillor Burdett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and my question is via you to Pauline. <clears throat> the Maori freehold land debt is 5.5 million. I've been here a long time and this hasn't improved. My question to you is how much time given that we all have to pay our rates, how much time does the revenue team put into chasing outstanding Maryland debt? Um, I guess there's a, there's a lot of things um, that are in there that, that they do spend a lot. And bear in mind that, as you can see, that 5.5 million is, is over the statutory Bad, and you have a certain amount that actually occurs. And so the wider issue when we saw the legislation change, it looked at um, are those rates uh, collectible in, in terms of uh, was there any revenue associated with it? And so the, the legislation change actually take that into account and, and it gives the powers to the CE to actually look at this and uh, um, have we created unnecessary burdens with the way that we do things to release um, uh, and uh, some of the previous rates in the future. And that's a part of the work that we uh, have done um, some, um, as it said, it's recognised in there, there was about um, 300k of now deemed unrateable um, uh, land uh, rates on Maori freehold land. Um, we will need to go through more because the situation um, isn't that the, uh, that the team are not being able to collect it. Um, or spend enough time into it is actually a wider issue. And that's the part that we're trying to come back and actually see what is the strategy um, is associated with it. Each year, the statute bar um, comes through and we, we write it off because it is uncollectible. And you can see that within that graph on 97, that those levels haven't gone down and mostly uh, they are a function of penalties. Um, so, uh, the terms of that, it, it is a piece of a, a, a greater work that we are actually doing and investigating and seeing how do we um, look at the full uh, Mary Freehold land across our district. Thank you. Uh, and supplementary to that, Madam Chair, <clears throat> Pauline, I'll put this to you. Given <clears throat> we've practiced the same way of trying to, to uh, recover those rates, do you not think it's time that this council in particular had a look at a different type of, of uh, <clears throat> action? I mean, uh, Maori respect one-on-one. -on -one. They will listen. Do we ever get to that? I am hoping, um, hoping that uh, as part of the process that we come through and we start to engage the whole thing that we said with our emissions, the whole things that we are looking at that, how do we do that? How do we do that differently? Um, and that's part of sort of um, analyzing what's the issues, what are the barriers and how do we go forward to make a, a, a change? Um, so yes, um, uh, that is part, definitely, of um, what we're trying to actually do within the next uh, six months, just to quantify the issues, it comes back to you, and then within the, the next 12 months of what are the other things and, and options and tools, how we go forward. And supplementary again, Madam Chair, um, none of the councillors here would have the knowledge that many years ago, we had an officer by the name of Adrian Stewart, who was given a six months contract to get out and he was very, very successful. The amount of money that came in more than outweighed what it cost to put him on the road and the admin backup. So all I'm suggesting, you look at all options. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Councillor Sheldrake. Oh, thank you. Um, really, it was on the back. I think Pauline's pretty much answered it. So really, it's another probably 12 months 
18 months before we, we, we get a, a strong plan in place to address this, um, this debt. Um, there's, there's two parts um, that you'd be looking at. It's, it's trying to look at our, what is the overall strategy and, and, and what are the policies and things that we have to do. And so that means consulting um, as well. Um, we would be allowing to have some tools um, that, that the CE has powers. Um, that's part of it. Um, but in terms of it, it, it is a wider um, aspect that we actually need to do and making sure that we've got the uh, the right way that we engage, that we've got the right solutions that you um, and the right strategies. So uh, it's not a simple fix uh, with it um, because we want to make sure that we've got the right solutions for our area. Okay, thank you, Pauline. Councillor Sheldrake, are you willing to move this paper now that I have you online? Yes, I am willing to move this paper. Thank you. I'll second this paper. Um, all in favour? Contrary, carry. Thank you for that. Thank you, Pauline. Um, I'm just letting everyone know I'm going to push through. So if you want a coffee or a bathroom break, just quickly pop away because I want us to finish this, uh, say, in the next half an hour or so, and then we'll take a lunch break and come back if that's okay with everyone. So we move to our next paper, which is on page 99, our financial report. Thank you, Mary, for this report. Pauline, do you want to give us a quick, thank you, it was very thorough. I do enjoy the notes. They're really thorough and let us know why we have the um, delays or why there are some funding delays. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, just want, um, it, it is what it is and it's pretty much, um, it says it um, as it sets out. Um, but. Uh, in terms of the capital, um, where we are now and we're getting, say, seven months or eight months, um, there are some pressure points um, in terms of supplies um, and, in, um, and also uh, the ability to be able to do some work when it's on public um, land. Um, and so there is an expectation um, coming through that some of uh, the projects may have, have to require a bit of um, carryovers into the next year, but we're assessing where they are and whether they will be able to get back on track um, with it. But um, happy to take um, any questions. Quite straightforward. If there are no questions, do I have a mover? Thank you, Councillor Akuhata Brown, seconder, Councillor Warsnop, all in favour. Hands up. Larry, do you have a question? Um, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll leave it to the, to the next paper, actually, because it's, it's in there as well. Okay. So, councillors, we now move to a paper. Thank you, Tim. Page 111 is the paper on the shared services. So, um, oops. Did I mute myself? Oh. Thank you, Tim. Do you want to give us a quick chat on the paper and then I'll open for questions. Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'll take the paper as read, but obviously the main, the main purpose of the initi initiative is to produce um, efficient, efficiency gains <clears throat> for the delivery of services that are currently being provided by um, regional bodies um, by consolidating them into one organization um, and we currently pay for and utilize a number of these um, these programs individually but this change in structure would, would mean they're all housed under one roof and um, it would also give us you know access to any new initiatives that 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 come up um, you know they could come up on a, on a case by case basis but the benefit of this process is that they would put in a business case if, if there was the opportunity to, and any, any participating councillors would have to agree um, to any new initiatives that they come up. And certainly from discussion with some of um, with some of the directors, there was, we you know, they see there's some potential value um, if there were new services to come up potentially along in the area of um, freshwater accounting or farm environmental plans, potentially um, climate change emissions reporting 
um, and that sort of thing. So, but currently, really, it's just a, it's a restructuring of of existing programs that we already pay for, um, but being housed under one roof for efficiency gains. So, that's that's pretty much a nutshell. Um, happy to take any questions. Okay, I've got Councillor Faulkner and then Councillor Foster. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Tim. Um, I guess my question is uh, for yourself and, and possibly our CEO as well. Um, I fully understand and appreciate that most of the changes involved here will be behind the scenes, so there won't actually be much change uh, for either ourselves as elected members or indeed our community. Um, whilst I'm happy to move the paper and it makes perfect sense to me, I guess I just wanted to ask um, whether you had any concerns or word of caution around uh, timing uh, or timeliness perhaps of deliverables, um, given that we are unitary, um, you know, the, the, we don't have four councils all working in one region, we've only got ourselves. Uh, so that would be my first thing around timeliness. Um, but the second thing around um, the ability to communicate uh, the outcomes, and, and as I say, I appreciate most of it is in the back room, so it won't be um, community facing, but given our, our current move towards um, you know, a much deeper engagement with mana whenua, for example, and the likes. So it's really around making sure that we have um, great a, a, a confidence that uh, this platform will continue to carry our aspirations in that regard. Um, I mean, Nadine, okay. do you have any? Oh, sort of yeah, I'm just just waiting to see. I've lost. Oh, there you are. There. Sorry. Um, I was just just in terms. Of, I was going to make a comment on it. So, um, early, kind of mid last year, the regional sector chairs and mayors tasked the regional CEs to um, go away and look at an innovative, um, well, if you could call it innovative, new model um, for shared services support. So this was one of the um, the options that we had come up with, or the initiative that we've come up with. Um, there were already there is already a structure that's been set up. Um, which is effectively a CCO of which some founding councils have been funding into. This is now joining um, other councils to that mix and broadening the opportunities that we could then share services um, across different uh, different areas. So it then takes the pain away, like if we were to move down a shared kind of consenting regime process, we've got something set up. Firstly, it'll focus on more of the... Um, the easier ones, which are like our tech solutions um, and shared information data platforms. Um, but yeah, it's very much in terms of its timeliness, it was something that was requested last year. Um, some councils are already on board and doing it, but ones like us, because it's effectively a CCO, um, we need to, as required by law, um, undertake that um, public engagement just to say this is, you know, these are the opportunities here. Um, and in terms of the um, outcomes, it, I see it wouldn't be no different to how we um, how I report back and how BOPLAS reports back in, in terms of the, what it's been doing and be held accountable to the councils that fund it. Thank you. I just had a question texted to me. Will Auckland also be part of this? Yes, Auckland is. Uh, yeah, my understanding is Auckland is already part of it. So the other way is that how it works is that um, there's a tiered funding system. So the bigger the council, the more of the share that you pay. So like Bob Plass. Yeah. Kapai, Councillor Foster, then Robinson, then Arkwata Brown. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, no, I, I can only see um, benefits coming from this. Um, and um, with the employee constraints that we're going through at the moment, um, you know, some of the information that we might be able to get from this could help big time. And um, um, with, um, like Nadine was saying, with consenting and everything like that. But my question is, um, will we need BOPLAS um, once we get into this? Will, will this um, take uh, take over the insurances and all the other different things that we do with BOPLAS and, uh, on a bigger scale? So will we will we be involved with BOPLAS in the future? I uh, through your worships. Uh, so we will continue. Well, my view is that we will continue with BOPLAS. BOPLAS provides a different um, service that this one would in the regional sector. BOPLAS is also heavily TLA focused. 
Um, and we do get some benefit from, even if we looked at like a passive kind of um, um, participant in BOPLESS, we do get significant savings through our insurance schemes and other health and safety initiatives that they put out, and we already have those established relationships. So to my, to my mind, this one, this carves a different space uh, in terms of the regional council functions that we deliver, that we don't necessarily get the expertise um, nor the service from Botless. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, and then Ark Water Brown. Um, I have two questions. The first thing is, what is the cost of exiting the uh, arrangement if we choose to? Uh, I'm, I am, would need to come back to you on that, Council of Robinson, but um, there is, we currently already contribute to the regional sector. Um, I, don't, I don't see that there would be any significant cost, but let me come back to you on that, um, Council right. my second co My second question is, uh, as I understand this uh, arrangement, it is around um, regional council expertise and resourcing. Um, is it going to devalue or water down our distinctive Tairawhiti region voice in um, advocacy with central government or any other fronts like that? What is the potentials there? What are the no, no, short answer is no, it will not, um, Councillor Robinson. Um, the, the, the regional sector does have quite a powerful voice um, with central government currently but that's a sector-wide lens. Um, it never puts itself in the position of um, being the, the actual regional or sub-regional level voice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Listen, um, you've kind of answered my question anyway, Nadine, because Councillor Robinson asked it. It was really around equity uh, within our region at that regional space um, because you know we are glorious and golden here in Tarafati and it's um, how we <clears throat> I guess how we are uh, I guess put into that regional space and 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 ensuring that there's an equal kind of I guess voice um, the resource and, and all that Councillor Robinson mentioned um, that would be my only <clears throat> because I know that we are definitely as a nation looking at how we can be better in our resourcing because it's in the report you've noted, uh, we get asked to do more with less. So if it means that we can lean into others in other parts of region, um, certainly that's going to be beneficial for all of us because that's what we want is better for all um, in this space. So that would be my only was the only kind of light came up was around that equity um, that kind of there's a strong voice in this mix because we still quite like our localism and <laughs> and all that we bring um, as as a unique region. So. There, but it seems like you've answered that um, already. Thank you, Madam C. Kilda. Kilda. Okay, do I have a mover? It's a noting report at this stage. Yeah, I moved, Madam Chair. I'm lying about the noting report. <laughs> um, but it is to talk to our community just so that we, Tim has now given us the, the skeleton of what's going on here and now we go out to our community flesh it out with them and then come back informed and make a decision yes yeah. I, I moved it madam chair moved by councillor faulkner seconded by councillor akawata brown hands up carried thank you for that thank you tim okay councillors so now we're moving to our last big report and you know usually i run this quite loose and I allow for lots of questions, but it is really difficult doing that um, via Zoom, as I've alluded to you in email. So as this is a report, which most of your questions I'm quite comfortable would be able to be answered a clarification question via email. I, as per my email yesterday, asked if there are any just emails of clarification or just asking that you please email those to that thread and then staff can answer those. Um, I am happy if anyone has a question that they want to ask now. I'm not shutting down questions. I just want to make sure that we do um, stick to high level questions. Any smaller questions just of, of clarification, please flick an email um, to, to, to that thread and then I will pass it on to staff. 
So if there are any, so this is our page um, 119. This is our quarterly activity reporting. And I do think staff, it is a, a big chunk of work just in order for us to look at trends, where we're going in our different areas. So um, if there are any questions in regards to that, I have one from Councillor Foster. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just um, on page 127, you know, building consents. I mean, uh, we've been talking about it a lot, but um, when we would see the um, big red um, and uh, the commentary afterwards, it's um, really quite concerning that we're not be able to keep up with demand on us. It's um, down to uh, staff problems, staffing problems, but, um, you know, this, this, is, um, this is not good. So how are we going to rectify this? Uh, if I could address that, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Larry. That's a, it's a very good point. Um, we have had some issues keeping up with demand, as we all know. Um, we are very much in a building boom at the moment, which puts a lot of pressure on our staff. Um, and so our timeframes have been slipping a bit just with the increased number of consents. Um, we are in the final stages of contracting a... Um, a company that helps process building consents. So they're going to come on board uh, with us and we're going to be able to improve those timeframes um, using them as consultants to, to help us process consents. Um, we managing to keep up with our inspections, um, you know, on site, which is really good because obviously getting anybody in from far away to do that would be, would be very difficult. But we do have plans in place. Um, we have made some marked improvements. We're up to 80% again, um, but obviously those numbers don't, don't show yet because they're in the next quarter. Okay. Have we, have we got any um, frustrated um, building owners or people that are um, you know, particular issues um, and different you know, building consents that are, that are um, being problem, more problematic than others? We always have that. <laughs> Um, it's just it's just part and parcel of, of applications coming through. Um, but we, we do deal with them. For the most part, um, we are moving those things through as quickly as we can and obviously paying particular attention to um, those that are aimed to addressing, you know, some of, some of the lower income housing, et cetera. Um, one of the things that, that has helped out a bit is that um, Kainga Ora have their own processing now, so they don't actually rely on councils to process their consents. Um, but the consultants and the people they have doing work for them, which they then obviously buy on completion, does come to us. So that that puts a little bit of pressure on. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Foster. Next, Councillor Warsnop, and then Councillor Seymour. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my uh, first of all, I just wanted to say well done on the territorial and regional consents. They show quite a big improvement, and just want to acknowledge that because we, we certainly heard plenty from us about them. Um, obviously, it takes a shine off a little bit that some of the pressure has moved into building consents, but that's probably not unexpected considering where we are in um, building cycles. Um, so, my my uh, there was a couple of points I just want to raise because they probably have some public interest. Um, the first being on page 155, where uh, we know we had the discharge to the rivers um, in that one in 50 year event. And I, I'm just not sure that um, reporting it as zero in a green light is, I'm just wondering if there's a different way that we can capture events like that, because obviously just because it's a bigger event, we, we don't really want to say um, yay, because <laughs> it's still not yay. Um, so that was just to highlight that maybe that we need another category that drops down a level and says, well, hey, how many of these do we have that are, you know, um, for, for more significant events? Because everyone knows that it did happen. And for us not to record it, that doesn't really look good. Um, and just on one page 66 is my last question. There's a number of minor transgressions um, with regards to uh, the safety of drinking water and because they all have the same narrative, my question was around, are they the same transgression or are they different ones occurring in a similar theme? Thank you. Those are my questions. So through your worship, um, the safety and drinking water, they were different um, events that have happened as part of it. Um, for the city supply, it was related to switching over some of the automation services that we had. So we had to report on those. If um, councillors are not aware, we've undertaken some large upgrades up at Wainake. 
very short time, um, which was less than minor, um, hence why it's worded that way, around whether or not we had the reporting consistently through. For Tikaraka, we had a couple of issues there, and with Wharatutu with the plant, that was nothing around human health or anything like that. It was more around the reporting and the way that the analytics work on the quality of the water that's going through the system. Okay, last question, Councillor Seymour. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm on page 149 and around the solid waste, and uh, that's the first box. And I'm really, I, I can have huge sympathy with council officers and the contractors who are required to deal with it. And But it says here, increased collection, and seriously, it is, and it's still visible. And actually, it takes quite a while for, some, for the RFSs to sometimes be responded to. So my question is, and why I was given this reason, the of the paper being written on a recovery centre. When can we expect um, that report on the recovery centre so that maybe there is an opportunity for people to recycle large items? I mean, I know there is an opportunity now once a month on a Sunday for um, recycling to be put out, but you see it on the coast road all the time and we, we, not to denigrate some of the freedom campers, others choose to leave the stuff they don't want behind, like old couches. And yesterday and today, there's a mattress propped up against one of the big bins that have been put out there. And so that's just one small portion of our district. So I have a real concern and I have sympathy for the fact that we, that we do have contracted to do it. But my issue is how long it takes to pick up the debris and when will we get this report on a potential resource recovery centre? Thank you. So through you, Madam Chair, the report on the Resource Recovery Centre, I understand, is not coming to tomorrow's operations, but it will be the following operations meeting where it should be ready to be able to come by then. As part of that, we'll be talking about the waste plan going forward for the waste collection contracts and in particular around illegal dumping, what we can do to make it easier for people to put their waste in the right place and the different mechanisms we'll be doing as part of the new contracts. Thank you. And, and a question, just um, is there some reason why it takes quite a long time for the large objects to be removed? Like uh, three, three, your worship, we're working with our contractors around their response times. A lot of the times it's whose property it's sitting on and whether it's us, Waka Kotahi or Dock, um, we are looking to see how we can move things up. Um, but it really does fall. Sometimes it goes to the wrong person rather than coming through to who it needs to to get rid of it. Thank you. Okay, hey, Councillor Akawata Brown. Just still with the solid waste, uh, Kōrero. I had asked this question earlier to CE, and she mentioned I should question you, Mr. Wilson, regarding it. So, um, just one of the complaints um, I've received from residents is uh, Crawford Road. Um, sometimes rubbish is collected, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, one resident has called in, but I just wonder when, we, with the cycle way, there has that been a barrier or constraint? one of the constraints to the waste collection but also um we hear this often well i do uh, from people that someone their rubbish isn't collected and i know they used to sticker uh, in respect to a message saying it was over full or whatever but i just know that that's frustrating a few people is that there's been irregular collections of their household rubbish on their collection days and so people kick it kick the bins over and of course rubbish is through the streets. So um, is it time, I, I don't know, is there a re review around the waste management program currently based on um, issues residents are raising? Um, I don't know how many RFSs have come through, but that's something that I would like to know. Is there an issue why sometimes it doesn't get collected? So through you, Your Worship, we have a number of people complain about their refuse not being collected or not. One of the things that we do have, however, is cameras on the waste management truck, and often we will go back through that footage and there will be nothing out when the truck went past, so they have missed the collection time for that. Waste management are pretty good around going back around where they can and picking up, so they have been trying to run a service that Phil and the team have been doing where if someone misses it, they'll go back around and try and pick it up where they can. We can't do that for everybody, but for everyone, we're constant reminder, have it out before seven because yes, the truck may change its days and it might be eight o'clock for months and then they might turn up at seven o'clock next month because something's happened with staff or a breakdown or those things. So we try and keep it as regular as possible, but it is subject to change. For things where recycling haven't been picked up, it can a lot of the time there's contamination in there and then other times and they will sticker for that. If the, bin, if the bags are too heavy, they will sticker for that as well. But most of the time it's people have missed the collection. 
Sorry, so, so with regard to the Crawford Road cycleway frame, that hasn't impinged on waste management? That isn't? Okay, cool. Okay, last question, Councillor Burdett. <coughs> on page 179, progress on plan years one to three, catchments and biodiversity, long-term plan commitments one to three. The first, Almost six six uh, lines in there are refer to the Waipu River, our iwi engagement, the uh, <coughs> progress with pole planting. Tell me, David, why is given that uh, those dollars are now sat in the yard going into the eighth year, and the overall restoration of the Waipu River, they are not included in the program? Is it because supplementary, Madam Chair? Is it because MPI or Wellington won't fund it because for the benefit of my colleagues, those dollars are still being paid for by the wider Ruatoria community and community way back up into Tofi Para, but they were designed and made to go into the Waipu River. And let's face it, the first tranche <clears throat> saved Ruatoria, did a marvelous job. Since then, the rest have been sitting there. I understand there's some to go up below the Kainanga Hill. If that's the case, where did the money come from for that project? And why is it we can't do something about the dollars that are sitting in the Headley's yards to complement the restoration of the Waipa River? Well, Mr. Wilson. Three, Your Worship. The dollars that we have in the Headley's yard at the moment, as Councillor Bidet has said, we are moving some of those to the bottom of the Kainanga Hill. They've been paid for by an internal transfer between the roading department and the Land Rivers um, team. So there's a transfer between we're roading and purchasing those off. So they come off the amount that the rural Tauria uh, community will be paying for those dollars that are there. The installation of any further dollars is awaiting the strategy for the Waipu as to whether or not they go in and where they go in as part of that. So we don't have any funding at this stage to put any more in, but it's contingent on the Waipu catchment plan being agreed to, so as to whether or not where and if they go in will be part of that. Thank you. If this is ongoing, David. Thank you. It wouldn't be a committee meeting without you asking me about the council of <laughs> I was I was thinking the same. Councillor Bidet, are you happy to move the paper? I don't think there's any discussion. They're moved by Councillor Cranston, seconded by Councillor Gregory. Hands up, all in favour, on free. Okay, councillors, so we have now come to the end of this part of our agenda. So what I'm going to do is we're going to break for half an hour. So it is 11.30 um, now, so we will come back at 12 o'clock. Kapai, we'll see you then. Just make sure you are on mute. Um, um, Free Worship, can I just ask a question, though? She's yep. gone. Uh, oh, yeah, there you are. Um, uh, PwC were at 1 o'clock, booked for 1 o'clock. Are you moving the meeting would you be able to touch base with them, Pauline, and see if they're yeah. available at 12? Okay, I, I'll, I'll check on that, yep. Um, that would be good because otherwise we, um, yeah, uh, if, if there are, I'm of the let's get working and get it out of the way. Um, I'm not sure how everyone else feel, but to me, let's get it done. Uh, uh, it would can. only be if it's um, a problem that they've, book their time out because one o'clock was the time um, that they had slotted in. So I'll just, I'll, I'll let you know and I'll send it out as, a, as an email, et cetera. Send it out as an email. So everyone just check, otherwise we'll be back at 12. Thank no you. Problem. And yes, and, and just also I will, Councillor Seymour has, uh, Councillor Faulkner has got an apology and Councillor Farihenga had to leave us because he has got an emergency. So I just will add that to our apologies. We will see you at one o'clock, uh, at 12 o'clock. Otherwise, Pauline will let us know. 12 it is, 30 minutes. Yeah, could she text and email, please? Text and email. Okay, I move we go into public excluded.
Seconded by Councillor Sheldrake. All in favour, contrary, carried.